guys, it's GM Max, and today we're going to learn how to play one of my favourite openings. That is the London system with d4, d5, and the accelerated bishop to f4. Our game today is a game between Maxim Bashir Lagrave, spurning his favoured e4 in favour of the London, against the young Uzbek talent Nadia Bek Abdul Satorov in a title Tuesday chess.com blitz event of 2021. Now, Black played the move c5 here, which of course is not the only move in this position. There are definitely other ways that Black can play. For example, after knight to f6, e3, they might try to play it classically with a move like e6. But then we can go knight to f3, and if bishop to d6, a really nice wrinkle is to play the move knight b to d2. And I know knight b to d2 is that if they take our bishop, we can take back. And that is double pawn to give us extremely powerful grip over that e5 square, which could often translate into a powerful attack on the king if black were to castle short here. But if they don't castle, we can play the move c3, Make him a bit, make him a bit discouraged in terms of playing b6 and bishop a6, which we can meet b6 with a move like knight to e5 and, you know, get the jump on him with an alpha zero style attack with the h pawn. And, well, white's life is certainly quite comfortable here. Of course, there are a lot of other approaches. For example, bishop f5 is another try. But enough to e3 and e6, we can then push our pawn to c4 and potentially get some early pressure against that b7 pawn, which can lead to some quite interesting and fun play for white. Well, in the game, Abdus Satorov played the critical c5, playing a queen's gambit, a tempo down. Well, let's see how MVL made use of that extra tempo. He played the move e3, uh, black played knight c6, and white played the move c3. Lately, I've switched to the move knight f3, is a move I usually play these days with white, but c3 is the move order that I started with, trying to get some value out of the delayed knight to f3. One advantage of this move order is that after knight to f6 and knight d2, the, the move queen b6 that black played in the game is not as effective as uh, as it would have been beforehand. And we're going to see why in a moment. But do make sure to smash that like button as well to show your enjoyment of the video and to keep up with more of my stuff. Now if black does play a move like e6, I think that's a move we're pretty happy to see. You could always go knight gf3 and meet bishop d6 with a nice retreat of bishop to g3. Uh, the idea of bishop g3 is we're just keeping that tension between the bishop so that if they were to take, we would take back with the pawn and get a very nice attack down at h5 with the rook. But if they don't take, well, we put our bishop on d3, we put our knight on e5, and we get a very strong attack on the opponent's king with this knight e5 uh, outpost. Uh, it's worth pointing out that there's also the move bishop d3, where if those of you like to play the stonewall, you can play what I call the trash can stonewall with bishop d6. Takes, takes, and now to move pawn to f4, and then your knight can often come to the e5 square that way. We have a stone wall where you don't have the bad bishop on c1 anymore because we already traded it off. So that's a fun way to play for those who don't want to learn a lot of theory and just want to play some very fun, creative sort of chess. Uh, probably the best move for black though is to play bishop f5. This line's the reason I stopped playing bishop f4 more frequently because I do think that after knight gf3 and now to move queen b6 hitting this pawn, this does look to be quite fine for black. And even though white has a few different tries, in general black should be doing quite well in these positions. There are some sharp lines with dc5 and then queen b2 and knight d4 that you can explore where these lines get very messy with the attacks on all different pieces. But in general, black should be quite all right, objectively speaking. So in the game, black played queen to b6 and now white played the move. Well, what would be the move that you would play as white? Now, do make sure to hit that subscribe button for more of my chess videos. And in the meantime, let's see what white played. He went for the move queen to b3, eyeing that queen on b6 and saying that, well, if you take me, I'm going to take back with the pawn. And just like we saw with the London bishop with h takes g3, well, now we have the London rook, where this rook now has a nice half open file. And if black were to take that pawn on d4, then we can see that this is actually a very nice chunky pawn structure, like knight f3, b4, b5. We're able to take control of the center and have a very pleasant end game advantage. Instead, black played the move c4, kicking the queen around, but after queen c2, this structure is extremely pleasant for white, because that pawn is actually a bit overextended on c4. What a lot of inexperienced players do, and what made black do a bit in this game, is he only looked in terms of the tempo on the queen, not realising that when the queen moves back, you don't have a good follow-up to your attack, and you just weakened your position. So after g6, this is a very important break now for white to know about, because if you give black the move bishop f5 with a tempo, that queen is forced back, and black's going to have a very healthy position with the space. So we hit first, e4, bam, and the d5 pawn 
is uh, going to be in some trouble here. If you play a move like e6 as black, trying to build a nice pawn chain, well, white's got more space, and he can even play a move like e5 to get a very nice French defense structure, where some of black's pieces are not on the best squares. In the game, Abdus Satorov played knight takes e4 instead, and after takes, takes, well, obviously, queen e4 would run into queen takes b2, but it's better anyway to play bishop takes c4, making sure that we have the better pawn structure, because black's pawns are doubled, and that e4 pawn is a bit of a target. You'd be amazed how many times I've got this position in my games as white, even against very high rate players to get a very nice advantage. So it's a nice little positional trap for you guys to remember. After bishop g7, uh, MVL played knight to e2. And after castles, he also castled with the move castles here. And it's a tough position where black is basically going down a pawn, I think, almost no matter what he tries. Because if you try to defend that pawn on e4 with bishop f5, obviously you don't have pawn to f5 because of the pin from the bishop to the king. Well, now I can play the move of knight bishop e3, and that's already threatening a move of d5 to hit that knight and also discover an attack on the queen. You've got ideas like knight g3 to go after the bishop and go after that weak pawn on e4. And if black goes for a move like knight a5 trying to harass the bishop, even a move like bishop b3 is quite safe, where we still have the idea of going after this weak pawn on e4, which is going nowhere. And if black does take our bishop, again, you recognize that our rook comes into the game and the double pawns are actually much better for white than black's double pawns are. And with the center being closed, the bishop pair is not really all that valuable at the moment. This may explain why uh, Abdus Satorov went for the move e5. But this is a pawn sacrifice. And after d5 and knight e5. Actually, at this point, I think that MVL didn't play the best move in this position. If I was in his shoes, I would not have played the move bishop e5 and given up the bishop pair. Instead, I would have played the move bishop to d5. Trying to have our cake and eat it as well to go after that e4 pawn and not give up the bishop pair in the process. So if bishop f5 is played, well, a move like knight g3 might seem quite tempting to go after the bishop. But then knight d3 might give black some counterplay against the bishop and against the pawn on b2. So I would go bishop e3 first just to kick that queen away. You know, if queen b5 we have the move c4 to again kick the queen with a tempo. And if they do retreat the queen, well we can take the pawn and... Well, in this case, we're basically a pawn up with queen takes e4. And black does get some compensation with rook f8 and try and get a knight c4. But I think if we stop that with the prophylactic move b3 and then just put the queen on some square, you know, get the rooks in the center, feels like white should be quite significantly better with correct play, where black's initiative will run out eventually. Uh, but instead, MVL got greedy and played the move bishop e5 immediately. And now we see that basically black gets as a compensation very much like in a martial gambit of the Royal Lopez. He's got the bishop pair and he's got the active piece play. And also the threat of bishop takes h2 does sort of give black some initiative. White played to move queen to f3 going for the counter attack on this pawn. But actually just gave black an opportunity to regain the pawn which he actually didn't see. Can you do better and find a move with black to play? So I would invite you to comment below to share the move that you would play and see if you can play better than GM Abdul Satorov, one of the youngest chess grandmasters of all time. Now, those of you who have watched my video on capturing free pieces, well, you'll probably notice that the c4 bishop is undefended and the h2 pawn is only defended by the king. And it turns out we can actually combine attack and defense, which is the best way to defend, with queen c7 hitting the bishop and also hitting h2. So that after bishop b3, bishop h2, king h1, and now just a bishop retreat, just making sure that we're not going to lose the bishop to a g3 trap. Well, black has the bishop pair. He's even got ideas of trying to harass the white king, and I think that black is at least equal at this point. Uh, this is one reason by why why probably knight g3 might have been a better try, but still black would be doing fine anyway. Uh, but after queen f3, bishop f5, well, that gave white the tempo he needed to re-establish control. He played a move bishop to b3, uh, he could have considered putting the pawn on b3 as well. Because now the move a5 was a very good move by Abdul Satorov. And you know, putting the pawn on b3 would have avoided this a5, a4 using the bishop as a hook. You know, probably seen a lot of games where grandmasters play moves like a5, a4, or h4, h5. And often just to create some weaknesses in the opponent's position or to use the bishop or pawn as a hook. Well, I played the move knight g3, and I actually think that this might not have been the best move. I think that instead a move like rook f to d1 would make more sense. I think that MBL was worried about the move a4 and he wanted to try and make some counter threat. But actually a4 is not as real of a threat as you might think. Because in this position we have a nice tactic of bishop takes f7. And it's only a sham sack because after king f7 and g4 we are 
getting the pawn back with the pin. And we also get rid of black's bishop pair in the process. So that means the rising ending after, say, if they play like queen c6, well, we can take captures, 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 and, well, black can try to go bishop h2 and try to get his pawn back with king h2, rook e2. But remember, guys, we are not forced to capture. Chess is not checkers. And with the move king f1, white would still keep an advantage because after gf5 and knight d4, we are forking these two pawns and that will ensure that we do remain a pawn up when the dust has settled. Of course, Black would still have definite compensation with his active pieces, but the game is certainly very much, uh, well, one where White has the pawn and has somewhat better chances to win, I think. Anyway, the game saw knight g3, and again, I think that a move a4 would have worked quite well, just sort of ignoring the attack on the bishop, but instead Black played bishop g3, and I think that's definitely a mistake. Like, even a move like bishop b6 is better, because even if your bishop pair gets traded, well, you still are going to have your much stronger minor piece. The bishop is still a lot better than the knight here. We see a knight is dominated by the black pawn on g6. You've still got the pressure against b2, and black's going to take the open files. So there's definitely compensation for black here. But after bishop g3, you lose the main part of your compensation as black, which is that you had the bishop pair, and maybe what black might have not realized is that a4 is actually not a real threat in this position. Again, for the reason I mentioned before, that black can, white can play takes. And then after takes, the move g4 is again going to win the, uh, the bishop uh, back. But it's a much better version when black doesn't have the better bishop versus the knight like we saw in the previous line. Well, black played h5 and he's trying too hard to prevent everything. And after rook a1, just a very precise move keeping the control over the position. Uh, where this way, a4. Give me back with rook takes e8, takes, and then bishop takes a4. It's going to hit the rook. You know, as you can see, the black rook on a8 is deflected from the defense. And we also hit their rook so that they don't have time to take the pawn on b2 as it were. Well, the game saw rook takes e1, rook takes e1, and black played a move a4, because if you don't play a4, you're just a pawn down, and white has the much more active pieces as well. But after bishop d5, we see that there are bigger fish to fry than just with being a pawn up. Now with the move rook to e7, white has managed to get a very strong initiative, and when you have these positions with the queen and rook each, basically the king's safety and the activity of the piece are the two most important factors, and white is clearly winning on both of these. After rook take f8, white played the move rook takes b7. And then after the move queen d2, well, king h2 is just a good prophylactic move, avoiding any of these annoying checks along that back rank. And it's just very hard for black to free himself. You know, the rook and king are tied up to the defense. The black queen isn't really able to do all that much because the bishop and queen are just defending all of the white pawns very, very effectively. And you guys know the saying rook on the seven, frank money in the piggy bank. So the game went a3. White played the move c4, actually a very nice move here, realizing that the move queen a2 is actually a somewhat poisoned pawn, because here you actually can win the pawn back immediately with the move bishop takes f7. You know, well done if you guys spotted that tactic from afar. Because after rook takes f7, you've got queen d5 and you basically win the rook, because the black queen is completely out of position for the defense. The game saw the move queen to d4 instead, and white played very practically when move queen f4. Just saying, okay, I'm going to force the trade of queens because if you don't take, white's going to invade with the queen and, well, that's going to be bad news for that pawn f7, which is the only thing between the uh, the bishop and the king at the moment, or for that matter, the rook and the king. So black trade off the queens. And this ending is basically just going to be a win for white because the only way to free that black rook is to trade the bishops with bishop e6. But after takes and takes, now MVL realize that you actually are not forced to defend that pawn on f4. Again, one of the best ways to defend a threat is often just to find a good way to ignore it, which is often by making a stronger threat than the opponent's threat in turn. So what would be a stronger threat than taking the pawn on f4? Well, the answer would certainly be queening a pawn. So white player to move c5, pushing his past pawn, realizing that black is not in time to capture, because after c6, rook to c4, and the move c7, white is going to play to move rook b8 check, and then he's going to promote his pawn with c8 equals queen, and that's going to win... Uh, obviously, king f7 is not available, because then c8 queen would be a rather nasty discovered check from the rook. So after rook to c8, white defended with rook to b5, keeping his pass pawn safe. In such a position, black really needs to have his rook behind the pass pawn, making sure that he can stop the pawn in its tracks, but also keep the rook active to attack white's pawns. But obviously, he doesn't able to do that. And with king g3, MVL is just following the principle of keeping your king active in the endgame. Maybe the best defensive start might be to go king f6 as black. And admittedly, after rook a5 and rook c7, I'm not absolutely sure this is actually a win for white. Because I think that if these rook pawns get traded, then 
Certainly, Black's pieces are going to be very active, and with the active rook, Black can probably save the game with best play. But if King F3, Black can play a move like E5, maybe. But it's not so clear. I mean, after Rook A6, it is true that we are getting that pawn more and more far ahead. And after something like C6, even though Black does manage to get the pawn back, on the other hand, we're getting in Rook A5. And if they play King F6, then Rook C5 gives us the Rook in front of the pass, behind the pass pawn. So the black rook is completely passive. That being said, after g5, king e4, maybe black can still try and save this pawn, but it's hard to say. Like, it's only a position where it's sort of very narrow between it being a win for white and being a draw. But maybe black is just barely in the drawing margin by just putting his king here. But okay, it's quite clear that in a blitz game, it's very hard to see all of these moves in advance. And, well, in the game, black was not up to the defense of this rook ending. In any case, the game to king e7. White played the move rook to a5. And after king f d7, I think that this was a decisive mistake. I think it's probably not too late to go back to the plan of king f6 and e5. Because if black is able to trade off some pawns and get his king to go after this pawn, I think the arising ending could still be a draw if black were to play all the best moves. Or at least he has a better chance with this than what he got in the game. Because after king d7, the problem for black is that the g6 pawn and by extension the h5 pawn are just very weak. And white exploited that with a move king h4. After king c6, white played a move rook takes a3. Realizing that you're not in time to take the pawn because rook c3 would then win the uh, king, the rook via the skewer to the king. So after rook f8, white played g3. And black played a move rook f5 to try and stop the white king coming in to take the pawn, which would be really nasty. But after rook e3, ultimately black is just not able to cover everything at once because the e6 pawn is an additional weakness. You're often in endgame two weaknesses enough to, for you to be able to win the game if you can attack the two weaknesses. I can even add these past pawns being additional weaknesses for black because he has to tie up his pieces to stop these pawns from simply going down the board and queening. The game concluded king d7, rook e8, rook to f, rook e5, rook f8, king to g5. Uh, if you play king rook g8, the king is just going to penetrate with king f6 going after the e6 pawn. And it's clear that black is not able to defend all of his weaknesses simultaneously. The game saw king e7, white took the pawn. Black played h4, thinking, okay, let's play some giveaway chess. So g takes h4, rook takes h4, h5. And there's just too many passed pawns here. Rook f3 was played, h6, rook f6. King g5, rook takes f2. White played to move rook e4, which is just to make sure he can guard against checks from the back. And also put his rook behind the passed pawn. We had rook takes a2, h7. Rook a8, because again, rook h2, rook h4 is going to stop, make sure that pawn becomes a queen. After rook a8, king g6, rook h8, and king g7, the pawn is about to queen, and therefore Abdus Ator have resigned. So there you are, you can see with this game that basically the move bishop f4 is very easy for white to play. Of course, you can also play against other moves like knight f6 and so forth. But that is true, it does give like extra options where he doesn't play the move d5. Nonetheless, you can see that with bishop f4, it's a very easy setup. You can just play for a building a solid triangle of pawns with e3, c3, and moves like knight d2 and knight f3 to follow. It's very systematic, and even though it's a system opening, it's also a system where if black does not play precisely, we can often get quite a good position by sort of use, they can use the move order, whether it's by playing an early c4, or sometimes meaning queen b6 with queen b3, like we saw in the game, to neutralize the pressure against b2. So do make sure to like the video so that I know to make more how to play videos like this one and also subscribe to be updated with more of my Grandmaster Chess videos. So guys, good luck with playing the London system in the accelerated version with 2 Bishop F4 and I'm going to see you guys in the next how to play video.